Good afternoon. Welcome to the workshop Generating Pro-Life Action. I say that so that you make sure you're in the right workshop. Um, we have a lot of material to cover today, and uh, we, we are hoping for uh, your participation in this. A generating Pro-Life Action is just that. We want some action in the pro-life. And I'm sure that's why you're all here, to find out what you can do. And uh, so if you have any questions, if you think that uh, any of this should be applied in some place else, or if you have any ideas or suggestions, things that you'd like to say about it, please feel free to do so. Uh, these two gentlemen will be delighted to hear any new ideas that, are, that have come about. Uh, the main speaker, or actually the main two speakers for this workshop, are Rob Clary and Al Alban Romberg. Some of you may be familiar with Rob Clary. I'll introduce him first, then I'll let him come up and uh, uh, start their program. Rob Clary has uh, been involved in the pro-life movement for about two years now, I believe. Uh, he has started off and has been consistent with uh, sidewalk counseling. Sidewalk counseling is uh, standing outside the abortion chambers as the girls are going in to get an abortion and trying to get them so that they will talk with you for a little bit and you can explain to them uh, what an abortion is and what's going to be happening to them. These aren't exactly uh, the peaceful settings that you would imagine. The people in the abortion uh, chambers are losing big bucks and they don't want uh, Rob Clary or anyone like him out there. And uh, they, he has had quite a few confrontations in the past and he's also had some very good successes and uh, Rob Clary will be telling us about uh, his experiences in sidewalk counseling. Also with us is Alvin Romberg from California. He's a director of the Pro-Life Medical Association in California. He's also uh, been the one to uh, get the information on the Weisberg find. Some of you may have heard about that. That's where the uh, almost 17,000 aborted babies were found in a storage container in California, discovered in early 82. And uh, the documentation of that and the uh, disseminating of the information about it has been under his direction. Uh, some of you may have seen the uh, brochure, The American Holocaust, uh, downstairs with the uh, pictures of those babies. Uh, they have an excellent slideshow for you today, and I'm really looking forward to seeing it too. So without further ado, Rob Clary and Al Lumberg. Rob? Okay, check. <laughs> Thanks for the invitation today. And um, Well, it's just kind of like what David says, you know, uh, there's not a, a whole lot of talking about it. Uh, we can talk about a lot of things, but I think the main key is to do something. You know, we've been around here all day and we've heard workshops and uh, lectures and, and looked at a lot of material and stuff. And basically everybody in this room is pro-life. You know, we've seen, we know what happens with the unborn baby. We know what happens uh, to the mother after she's had an abortion. And I think one of the main keys is to take this information where it's needed. And a lot of those people that are going in the door of an abortion clinic, you know, either don't know or are pressured into it so many ways. And um, I'll just maybe kind of talk about how I got started in this thing. Um, David Gittrich, uh, a while back, uh, brought the movie Assignment Life to our church at uh, Christian Family Ministries down on uh, uh, South Hydraulic. And uh, when I saw that movie, you know, um, I don't know, sometimes you, you just kind of see a door in front of you. And you can do two things. You can either open the door or you can stand and look at it, you know. And, and I don't know, it was just something that, that really hit me kind of deep to think, that, my gosh, you know, we're killing little babies. And why, you know, because of our society, because of where we're at, what we're doing, the pace we're going, our priorities. Uh, and I thought there's got to be something that we can do, you know. Uh, other than just writing letters and, and being pro-life and wearing little feet and having brochures in our uh, libraries or whatever. But um, it wasn't too long after that that um, we had a, a picket out in front of uh, George Tiller's uh, place on, on East Kellogg. And um, I've always kind of liked to make signs and, and express myself on paper or billboard or whatever. And, uh, you know, I thought, let's go for it. Let's make some signs and we'll go down and we'll just we'll tell the world what we think about this, you know. And it more or less started out from that. And um, we started, uh, well, from my church, we got a few people uh, gathered about us. And, 
kept doing it consistently because, you know, after the whole thing was over, everybody just kind of went their own way. And I thought, my gosh, you know, let's don't just do this one time and, and forget about it for a half a year. Let's, let's, keep going, let's keep going with it. You know, I spent two hours making that sign. I'm going to use it more than once, you know. <laughs> and um, basically at that time, you know, I, I, I didn't know a whole lot about the abortion thing or anything. I just, you know, all I knew was, hey, this is, this is wrong and, and we got to do something about it. And I didn't know a whole bunch about the semantics and all of the uh, linguistic garbage that goes along with it. But um, we started picketing Wick at, uh, Wesley Hospital uh, pretty consistently on Saturday mornings, uh, about maybe four or five of us, you know, just a, just a small group. And um, handing out literature, uh, one of the things that I'd like to hand out is the uh, Keith Green track that has a lot of good information about abortion and stuff. And you know, we were coming across people that were going into the hospital and handing them literature about abortion and just uh, more or less trying to be as informative as we possibly could. But I always kind of felt like a need to get closer to where the abortions were actually taking place. I and mean, even though they are going into Wesley, Wesley such a, a big place. You don't know who's going in for an abortion or who's going in to have their tonsils removed or whatever. And so um, it wasn't too long after that till we started going down to the abortion clinics like on uh, East Pine and uh, Wichita Women's Center on uh, North Market where they do primarily nothing but abortion. And, um, boy, I tell you what, when that, when I got down there and got on that sidewalk, you know, we, we were just picketing at the time and, you know, handing out literature and stuff. Uh, to see the people go in and to see them come out, you know, I remember the first thing I saw one time was a, a Vietnamese man pulled up by the door and he opened up the door and went inside. And I thought, what's this guy doing, you know? And he literally carried his wife out. You know, she was debilitated, and later on the seat, and I just watched her, you know, fall over in the seat, and I thought, man, you know, not only has she gone through a lot, but I think of what happened to that little baby, you know, where is that little kid now, you know, um, everybody talks about, you know, we got to be free, we got to do what we want to do, and I think, what kind of freedom is it that causes us to end up in a spiritual condition like this, you know, but anyhow, um, we were talking to people, and, and I think the, the, the picket signs were being intimidated for a negative deal. Like, you know, we try to keep the two separate sidewalk counseling and picketing separate because it's kind of hard to talk to people sometimes when you got a picket sign in your hand, you know, and it's, you know, everybody just kind of equates that with radicalism or whatever. Well, it is, but, you know, it just kind of hurts to t try to talk to a person one-on-one -on -one with a group like this. And uh, one day I went out to um, the clinics, and I was the only one there. And I didn't really want to feel, I didn't want to be the only one carrying a picket sign, so I didn't. I just put it down and I had some information, and I was really amazed about how receptive people were to talk to me, you know, uh, without the picket sign. So, but, you know, as I'm going through this thing and, and uh, you know, growing as we go, we kind of learn a little bit more about what works and what doesn't work. And, um, but it's, uh, it's something that really needs to be done. Uh, I remember the first baby that was saved, it was just... You know, I don't know, I could, I could just sit here and tell you all day about how much it's blessed me to be in the right place at the right time, you know. And I mean, I didn't even plan on going down there. This was uh, last year, right in between Christmas and, uh, and New Year's. And I was on vacation. I, was, I got a hamburger and I was driving along and, and I thought, well, I'll pull over and eat my hamburger. And I was right there by the clinic. I thought, well, I'll just pull over by the clinic and eat my hamburger, you know. So I was sitting there and I was, you know, this is like on a Wednesday afternoon about 1 o'clock. And I thought, gosh, there's a lot of people going in and out of there, you know. And um, I saw this guy sitting in a car with a, with a little boy. And I thought, well, you know, I, I'm not doing nothing much. I ought to go home and get my binder, come back, and maybe, you know, pass out some information for a little while. And I, I ran home real quick, and I got my binder, and I came back. And when I came back, uh, that guy that I saw sitting in the car with a little boy, he was coming out of the clinic, and he was just kind of walking to his car. So I thought, well, I just kind of meet him halfway there. And... Um, hand him a track and see what happens, you know. So I, you know, I said, hey, you would like to take a look at this, you know, it's just some information about abortion and, uh, you know, just read it, see what you think, you know. Kind of a probing thing, you got to kind of see where people are at. And um, he took it, you know, he was real happy to take it and he sat in his car, so I just started walking again. And uh, he got about uh, four paragraphs down, you know, reading this information and called me over to the car. And we just started talking about it a little bit and he was expressing to me that, um, you know, he didn't really believe in abortion. Uh, he knew it was really wrong, but, but you see, you know, he's, you know, from uh, Nigeria or whatever, and uh, is, they don't have a lot of money or anything, and, uh, they're, you know, they got a, a little baby that they just had not too long ago. And um, he was more or less giving me his reasons why he thought that, you know, this was the best thing to do. 
And I just more or less uh, showed him that, look, you know, hey, uh, if you need some help, you know, man, I, I, I'd be glad to help you. I know some people that will be glad to help, you know, if it takes money, whatever it takes, you know, just a, just a reach out, just a handout. And it was so amazing how quick this guy turned around. It was just like, you know, he didn't even want to argue about it. I said, there's a place called Birthright. I said, let's go over and talk to him, you know. And he was just all game for it. But, but the problem was his wife was already in the clinic. And as far as he was concerned, she was already on the table. And uh, he was saying, you know, I saw you sitting over there, you know, uh, when you left, I, I kind of, you know, I wish you would have came over and talked to me then. We probably could have done something about it. And I was thinking, man, if I would have just, you know, not re relied on all my materials or anything like this, but just went out and to reach out a hand, um, there wasn't a whole lot we could do then. I just kind of, we just more or less talked about some spiritual things and said, hey, you know, when she comes out, she's going to be debilitated. And, and in the time to come, you know, you two are going to really have to draw close to the Lord to really, you know, get this straightened out in your life. And uh, we more or less brought the conversation to a close, and um, I started walking again, and he went and sat back in his car. And about five minutes later, this woman came out, and uh, <laughs> she kind of looked at me, and I looked at her, and like, you know, like, ma'am, can I talk to you a minute? And she was looking like, you know, where's my husband or something? And she went over to the car. I thought, that's her, that's her, you know. And uh, it was so neat to see just that instant second, you know, how... You know, he just turned completely around, and he stopped her. He said, let's don't do this. There's this guy, and, you know, they calling me over to the car and stuff, and I thought, man, we got it, you know. And, uh, you know, when I think about that, it's very seldom that I ever tell this, but even when I think about it and all that stuff that's, that's happened like that, it's such a blessing just to be able to reach out to somebody who's in need. You know, people that were misguided, and... Um, she was excited. She got. She, she didn't want to have the abortion in the first place. He had pressured her into doing it. And uh, I don't know if you can picture a Nigerian woman jumping up and down, but she was happy. And she was, I just mentioned this off the hand, her first name is Blessing. And so if that's a key from heaven, I don't know. But, uh, and it's been, you know, it's been a year now, and the baby's been born, and he's a cute little kid, you know. And, uh... They're just, they just now moved here to Wichita. They, they were living in Medicine, Lo <laughs> Medicine Lodge, and we just got them moved here real recently and everything. So it's really kind of a new beginning for them. But as I look back on the whole situation, you know, um, I knew what God wanted me to do. I knew what he wanted. And, and I didn't want to go to those clinics. I don't like to go to those places. You know, when, I drive, when I'm driving there, I get a sick feeling in my stomach, you know, because I'm thinking, what's going to happen today, you know? But I also got to think of how that little child feels, too when he's riding to that clinic in his mother's womb, you know, and uh, <laughs> I get thinking, it don't matter how I feel, you know, and, um, and I want to look for every opportunity that I possibly can to be in that gap, to stand in the gap for that little kid, because he needs us, and that mother needs us, those people need us, and um, I don't know, there's, I'm just kind of talking off my head, but there's so many things that we need to consider where we're at in our own lives, our priorities, you know, what's really important to us in this life. When generations look back and think of this Holocaust, you know, who are, who, who are going to be the people that stood out and said, hey, they, they did something, they did something. What about my grandparents? Where were they when all this was going on? Um, and that's the thing I want to provide is just an opportunity, you know, for anybody who wants to communicate uh, life to uh, in a death situation. And it's not easy, you know. Uh, when you see them slip through your fingers and they go in and say, no, we don't need no information. We know what we're doing, you know. And they, you just see them slip through your fingers, mothers taking their daughters in and uh, kids, you know. <laughs> and it's discouraging, but, uh, you know, the blessing definitely outweighs it, you know. And, and I'm... I don't want to be trying to play some win-lose situation to where, oh, we chalk up another one here and we lose another one, we chalk up another one. I remember what um, Mother Teresa said one time. She said, God has not called me to be successful. God has called me to be faithful. And that's what we've got to rely on, that God has called us to do a mission. And whether we like it or not, you know, that's where we need to be. And um, so, you know, I might talk a little bit about kind of how we go about it. Uh, one of the things I put together, like I said, the whole key is to be a, a, a communicator. And this is something that I carry with me out there. We don't carry picket signs or anything. We just carry binders with information that has pictures of the baby in the womb. And if, you know, when somebody's coming up, 
you know, they pull into the car and they're they're getting out of the car just to be there, just to say, hey, you know, before you go and can I talk to you a minute? If you'd like to look at some pictures or something? Um, a while back we were meeting a lot of opposition to this. Uh, the NOW group, National Organization of Women, had uh, women coming out and combating us, you know, being out there. What they're basically were saying to these women is, uh, we want to get you in that clinic as fast as we can because these people have information that we don't want you to see. Because if you do see this information, you might change your mind. And, of course, that, that doesn't look real good to our movement. I don't know what goes on in their minds. But it's just really kind of sad when you're out there and you want to help people. And um, the principles of some movement gets in the way of wanting to reach out and just help somebody. You know, and I'm, I'm sure they look at us as a bunch of radicals. You know, here we're anti-abortion and all this stuff. But, gosh, you know, <laughs> um, one girl... I, she had a button on her, and it had a picture of a coat hanger with a with a line through it. And when I saw it, I didn't I didn't know what it was. I thought, what is that? You know. And I and they would never talk to us. They would. Uh, you could ask them a question, blank face, and they would they wouldn't even say anything. I don't know why. I guess they just didn't feel like defending themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, and it hit me later on what that button was, and that was talking about women that perform abortions on herself because abortion wasn't legal or whatever. And. Um, and I got thinking about that. You know, as a matter of fact, uh, NORAL, National Abortion Rights Action League, sent me this in the paper not too long ago. I don't know if anybody's seen this, but it's a really sick picture. And it shows a picture of a woman doubled over by a bed who had just performed an abortion on herself. And it said the caption above it. I cut the caption off because I sent it back to them with some of the abortion pictures. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but the, I mean, when I look at something like this, I mean, this is a sick sight. This breaks my heart to think that a woman would do something like this. You know, and I can see their point as far as, you know, we don't want this happening and I don't want it happening either. But and then the, go, the paper goes on to talk about, you know, because because this happens, we, we, we got to keep abortion safe and legal and everything. And I wrote a letter back to him and I told him, I said, you know, look, uh, I really appreciate the, sen- the picture that you sent to me. It's a real eye opener. But I also got to consider both sides of this issue and think of all of the millions of babies that have been dying, you know, brutally because of our selfishness and our pride. And I got to thinking, you know, this woman, she had a choice. She didn't have to do this. She didn't have to do that. She could have sought help. There is help available, you know. But that unborn child, he doesn't have any choice, you know. And um, what they're saying is the answer to helping people is killing people. And I can't find any logic in that. I don't, uh, I agree, that's a sad situation, but the answer is not killing people. You know, that's, that's gotten us in trouble in the past. But I can see where they're coming from, you know. And um, so, uh, (laughs) but it's been a real blessing to be able to interject some pro-life attitudes in this situation. Um, And I want to see more of it. It seems like at the beginning last year, there was a lot of it going on. A lot of people were coming out and and it's kind of died off a little bit. And um, it seems like January comes around and everybody gets kind of revved up and we want to go again we want to be able to be out there you know and, and it, it kind of looks pathetic sometimes you know you'd be out there trudging in the winter time and they look at it and say oh there's them pro-lifers again trudging in the winter you know but uh but it's neat man to see people coming out and being wanting to reach out and help somebody you know there's all kinds of things we can do having material showing the pictures say this let's, let's take a look at some pictures you know um gosh you know what's your baby look like at 12 weeks um Getting to know the people at Birthright. Go down and meet them, you know. Find out what they're about, where they're coming from. So when you meet a woman out there and, and she's saying, well, look, I just don't know what to do, you know. This is an option that everybody's given me. Uh, we'll say, well, let's go talk to some people. Let's, let's maybe get you a, a woman-on-woman situation, you know. And, um, you know, you kind of feel weird going into Birthright or something with some stranger and, and you're strangers with them, you know. Say, hi, people meet people, whatever, you know. It's neat to know them by name and to take them down there and say, hey, I know some neat people in Jan and, and, you know, people, uh, Kathy and Jenny, you know, and say, that just you know, they're, they're, we can work it out. We can work it out. Um, but it doesn't do a whole lot of good to have all this attitude and, you know, sit on watch TV, you know, or what I'm not, you know. I'm just saying that there are some neat things that we can do. And we need to check our priorities. Who's really number one in our life? And uh, when we look back on our days, you know, what are we going to say that we were able to accomplish for the name of Christ? Who, who did we really reach out and, and give a hand to? And um, there, the opportunities are there. I heard someone say, opportunity never stops knocking. We just get dull of hearing. 
they're there, man. You just look around, and people are hurting everywhere. Um, but anyhow, it's just, you know, I don't know where this family came from as far as their spiritual conditions or whatever, but uh, it's neat to think that they're going to come to church now, you know. And maybe this is a new start for them. You know, it's one thing to get somebody saved physically. It's another thing to get them saved eternally. And um, I see this as just a bridge to it. You know, it's kind of hard to lead somebody through a sinner's prayer when they're walking through the door of an abortion clinic. <laughs> you got to get something before that to show them that your Christ is real, that you're not just, uh, you know, you're not just all word, but your action too. And um, so if anybody is thinking about, you know, this might be an area for you, or if you know somebody that would, would like to do this, uh, we'd be willing to start up meetings for people to meet and talk and get together, and we can get information together and get ourselves Correlated to really go out and 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 uh, and really have an impact on these places. They don't like us there at all. They don't, you know. Uh, but it's conviction. You know, I was thinking of a scripture that says, um, "And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that does evil hates the light. Neither comes to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved." You know, you're not going to find those abortionists and all those people that work in those places coming down here and flipping through the literature and finding out. They don't want anything to do with it. And um, I get to thinking, you know, God has not called the world to go to church. God has called the church to go to the world. And that's where we need to be. And um, so uh, I've got some tracks and stuff that have my name and number on it. If, if anybody would like to pick up some of that stuff, then maybe give me a call or something. And, uh, and we can set up some stuff, and we'll probably be having some meetings that you can come to. And just talk with us. Find out, you know, what you can do. And winter's a drag. You know, I can't, I can't stand going out there and... In the winter time, you know, you, people will come in, and, and your mouth is frozen, and your hands are frozen, and you're trying to communicate something. But uh, you know, spring is coming around the corner, and um, and it's kind of neat to get up on a Saturday morning and, and be out there. And um, it's a nice time to get up. <laughs> you know, I don't know. It's it, you know, if if you if you wait until you want to go, you'll never go. You gotta you gotta be moved by conviction. You've got to say, not my will, but yours be done. I know when Christ went to that cross, he didn't want to go. You know, but he said, not, not my will, but yours, Father. And that's the attitude we need to have. So, um, and we need to know who's behind us. So, um, has anybody got any questions about anything that maybe I can answer? Yes, Nancy. Oh, the cap, are you talking about uh, this picture? Well, it's, it had a caption on it that said, never again. Oh, you're talking about the, oh, okay, yeah. I took the, uh, the um, Holocaust billboard <laughs> and, uh, took the caption never again and uh, mailed it back to him because really you know we're both saying the same thing we don't want this to happen but their answer is let's help people by killing people and i don't agree with that either i don't think that's the answer um i think moral conviction uh the preaching of the gospel is going to be what turns anybody around i remember sitting in a uh, a meeting oh they had the women's fair not too long ago here, and I come down here, and we were hanging around the place, and I sat in a, a workshop with Lynn Goodman of Planned Parenthood, and they went on, you know, she went on, got to have contraception, got to have contraception, we need to be in your schools, teaching your kids about contraception, you know, and <laughs> time came for questions and answers, and I thought, oh boy, you know, and I, I told this lady, I said, um, I said, you know, uh, uh, besides all the contraception and stuff like that, I think, you know, Coming from a Christian perspective, if I know God is there and I know God is real and I know that God loves me, and even though my parents may not be, be able to be in the car with me, I know God is. And that changes my attitude about what I'm going to do or not do. Of course, you know, they don't want to talk about that because that's religious and we're not here to talk about religious things. Uh, we're here to talk about Planned Parenthood and contraception. And besides, if you talk about the solution, then that takes care of the band-aid to the problem and they don't want to uh, be left out of a job if you're going around talking about the solution to the problem. <laughs> So, uh, but uh, anybody else got any other questions or anything? Or, yeah. Oh. Right, yeah, yeah. You, oh, yeah, they named him Robert. <laughs> uh, can you, I mean, can you imagine, you know, 50 years looking back and thinking, there's a little kid, you know, that's alive today, man, because, you know, he just wanted to reach out, man, and it's neat. I love it. I, I, I don't know if I'll ever stop doing this. I'll probably end up doing something else, you know, but uh, so far... Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sorry. 
<clears throat> yes, sir. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what, there's a, there's a question. Okay, you repeat, repeat the question, Dave. He just wants to know if you're going to go at the same time every week. Gotcha. <laughs> Basically, Saturday morning is the prime time to go. That's when they schedule most of the abortions. But there's other times. Um, Molly and Nancy have been going out on Tuesdays and Thursdays. In the afternoon, they do abortions. So it's really, they do abortions just about any time they can probably schedule them. But basically, it's Saturday morning is when they really bring in the meat. And that's when we try to be there. Uh, whatever the schedule will allow. Um, there's a lady that goes out and prays in front of the clinic whenever she can. And I think that's great, too. Because... Sometimes these people just need a friend. I was talking to a girl that I know who had an abortion one time at Tiller's place, and she told me that she was sitting in that lobby one time, and uh, somebody walked by the, the window, and the first thing that happened was that one of the nurses walked over and flopped down the window, you know? And she thought, whoa, 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 what was that? And Lace, uh, just, you know, she didn't even explain to her. She, if she, if, even if the nurse would have said, well, those are some people that come out here all the time, and they're, they're against abortion, and they help people, you know, that would have turned her around right there. But no, it wasn't that. Uh, so we work it out to whatever, you know, schedules can be worked out, uh, Saturday, Tuesdays, Thursdays, Mondays, whatever, you know.